The stories of Kingdom Hearts games have never been the easiest to understand, and Kingdom Hearts Union Cross is no exception. Plenty of Kingdom Hearts games have been re-released in an updated version at some point, and I'm not even talking about ports to newer consoles, but this one absolutely takes the cake. For a start, Kingdom Hearts Key was initially released in 2013 and only playable on internet browsers. After three years of regular content and story updates, the game was finally shut down, its story having concluded, and players were encouraged to continue playing the recently released Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key on Android and iPhone devices, a game that is a port, remake, and sequel to Kingdom Hearts Key all at the same time. What an impressive feat. January 2017 saw the release of Kingdom Hearts Key Back Cover, a cinematic telling of the events of the story from a different perspective, offering up new insight into the tale. And finally, in 2017, Kingdom Hearts Unchained was updated, renamed, and relaunched to Kingdom Hearts Union Cross to reflect both a significant update to the game and likely to try invigorate interest into the title. So as you can see, to understand all of this story, you need to have played all four of its parts. And unfortunately, one of them is no longer directly accessible, and it was only ever viewable in Japanese anyway. That's where I come in. I would like as many people as possible to be caught up to the story of these titles before the release of Kingdom Hearts 3. From what we have seen from the Kingdom Hearts 3 trailers and the in-game story revelations in Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, this collection of games will have a significant bearing on the events of Kingdom Hearts 3 and titles beyond. So let's try and make some sense of it. My name is Damien, and I will be covering the events of Kingdom Hearts Key, Backcover, Unchained Key, and Union Cross in chronological order. Let's begin. Almost all Kingdom Hearts games are set in the Realm of Light. In this reality, every conceivable place you could exist resides on one relatively flat plane. You may be separated from a location by land, sea, or sky, but if you travel for long enough, you can theoretically reach anywhere you wish to go. Though, there are such a vast, near infinite amount of locations that to reach them all in one lifetime would be impossible. This is the Realm of Light, an everlasting expanse of various locations that are for the most part unaware of each other, known as worlds. However, there exists an equal and opposite to this realm, the Realm of Darkness. If the Realm of Light exists on one side of a theoretical enormous disk, then the Realm of Darkness is the other side. To travel between these realms is impossible through regular means, and between them exist more neutral sub-realms, such as the Realm of In-Between and the Realm of Sleep. In all previously released Kingdom Hearts games, you traverse the Realm of Light visiting these various worlds, but to do so you require a special vessel to protect you. This is because a calamity has befallen the Realm of Light long before all of these games even took place. Most of the Realm of Light has been swallowed by darkness, with barely any fragments of light remaining. These remaining fragments are the worlds we visit in each of the games, surrounded by barriers that keep the darkness at bay, and it is the fragments of these barriers that Sora uses to construct a vessel to travel to other worlds. So why am I explaining this? Well, Kingdom Hearts Union Cross is a prequel to all of these games, allegedly set before the cataclysm that nearly doomed the Realm of Light. At this time, the Realm of Light is still the massive land I described earlier, a great expanse of nearly infinitely many worlds, too numerous to name or visit them all. These peaceful, light-filled worlds are watched over by one man known as the Master of Masters from his tower in a world called Daybreak Town. However, dark machinations seem to be brewing in the Realm of Light, and darkness is spreading within the worlds. Seemingly as a response to this new threat, regular people with a natural resistance to darkness are finding themselves granted with Keyblades, as if the worlds themselves are drafting people to defend them. The Master of Masters selects six apprentices and bequeaths them with a new name as well as their own unique Keyblades. The pupils assume that their selection is in service of saving the world from the impending darkness, but are surprised to learn that this is not the case. The Masters tell the apprentices that the world cannot be saved. Inevitably, there will be a great battle between every Keyblade wielder that will engulf the entire world in its grasp. Every wielder will perish, and there will be nothing left of the Realm of Light. But how does he know this? Well, here's the thing. The Master has the ability to see into the future. Using this knowledge, he has written a book of every event that will happen up to the Keyblade War, and distributes one copy of this book to five of his apprentices. These five will be known as the Foretellers, and become the leaders of five unions. As the chosen, ordinary citizens gain their new Keyblades, they align themselves with one of these five unions, under the instruction of their union leader. This is where our story, as the playable character of Kingdom Hearts Key, begins. But we have a few more things to cover first. 
So these new wielders are joining the different unions, and the Master of Masters reveals to his six apprentices that they have a secret role that the others are not to know about. First, a mysterious man known as Master Lushu. This young man will not get his own copy of the Book of Prophecies. He will instead take the Master of Masters' very own Keyblade and set off into the world, simply to watch everything that happens. This is because, and get this, the Master of Masters has implanted his own eye into the Keyblade and created some sort of temporal link with it, meaning wheresoever that Keyblade goes in its future, the Master of Masters can apparently look through it and see what is happening at that time from the present. The Master uses this foresight to write the Book of Prophecies, and therefore the fact that the book even exists means that Lushu is destined to complete his role. So off Lushu sets, taking with him the Master's Keyblade and a mysterious black box, destined to pass that Keyblade down to his eventual successors, and them to theirs, and them to theirs, until eventually the blade will find itself in the possession of Master Xehanort, and everything that happened up until that point will be known by the Master of Masters. Next to Ira, leader of the Unicornus Union. Ira is a studious young man, poring over his copy of the Book of Prophecies and very troubled by the final entry detailing the war. The Master presents Ira with his role. The Master will soon vanish, and when he does, it will be up to Ira to lead the other four foretellers in his stead. The Master insists here that the war cannot be stopped. They have to focus on what comes after. Though the Master does hint that if Ira wants to, he can try to prevent it. To support Ira, Master Ased is given his role. Though he clearly has aspirations to be the foreteller in charge himself, Ased is told that Ira will be the leader, and that he will be Ira's right-hand man. Although, should Ira fail to live up to the mantle, it will be up to Ased to take the role from him. Master Envy of the Anguius Union is the next to receive her role. An interesting young woman, Envy is to watch over the other five with a fair eye, and make sure everybody gets along. But she is also meant to speak her mind when she feels it's right. Master Ava of the Volpers Union is given a crucial role. She must ensure that when the war does come, there are people left behind, so that the world is not entirely lost to darkness. She is to find Keyblade wielders with potential and form an entirely separate organization. Then, when the war does come, they are to flee from the world, keeping the light alive. Among these chosen wielders, known as the Dandelions, Ava is to select five and make them the leaders of the new unions that will exist in this alternate world. The Master has written the names on a sheet of paper, and one of them will even receive their very own copy of the Book of Prophecies. The other new Union leaders must not know about the book, it is to be a secret. And the young Master Gula, leader of the Leopardus Union, finally receives his role. He must take a secret page that was not included in any of the Foretellers' books, concerning the actions of a traitor among them. He is to use this secret page and observe his fellow foretellers and see who deviates from their role, and from that he can conclude who the traitor is. Gula cannot be sure that any of his comrades, even his supposed best allies, can be trusted. He can trust only himself. Finally, the Master crafts little allies for every Keyblade wielder. These little spirits will be the constant companions and go-betweens of the wielders and the foretellers, they will hand out the missions and hold on to the lux gathered by the wielders. These Chirithis also act as a reflection of their wielder, and should their wielder fall to darkness, their linked Chirithi will become dark and turn into a nightmare. Though the foretellers and wielders may not know this, these Chirithis are Dream Eaters, the variety of companion slash enemy found in the sleeping realm we venture to in Dream Drop Distance. This should be a huge red flag for any viewers watching this that things aren't as they seem. With his six apprentices knowing and following their assigned roles, and new wielders joining the burgeoning unions every day, the Master of Masters, just like he said he would, disappears, and Lushu follows. Okay, with the introductions out of the way, it is time to introduce our playable character into the story. We begin having dived to our heart, as many Kingdom Hearts protagonists have before. We are asked to select one of the five unions before being overwhelmed by darkness. All of a sudden, a Keyblade appears in our hand, the Starlight Keyblade, which banishes the darkness, and we awake in a town called Daybreak Town. We meet our Union Leader, who introduces us to our own little personal companion, a being known as a Chirithi, who will give us daily missions from the Union Leader. We join a party of up to 30 wielders, and take down some small Heartless before teaming up with our new party to take down a larger Heartless boss. In this game, our character attacks by summoning the power of characters from the distant future, 
channeled through cards bearing their image. Another power of the Book of Prophecies. We will go into this a lot more at a later point. As we discussed earlier, darkness is spreading throughout the Realm of Light, and it will be up to us to defend the various worlds from this threat. This threat is actually the Heartless. Again, another red flag. How are the Heartless supposed to exist in the distant past? Chronologically, the first time we saw Heartless in the Realm of Light was when Master Xehanort used them to draw out Ven's strength. Emblem Heartless weren't seen until Ansem's apprentices began artificially creating Heartless far after the events of Birth by Sleep. Anyway, we defeat Heartless throughout Daybreak Town, but apparently the Heartless have cropped up in different worlds as well. So we take up our Keyblade and use it to travel to lands far beyond our own. These worlds are the various Disney worlds such as Dwarf Woodlands, Wonderland, Agrabah, Olympus, and Beast Castle. In these worlds, we meet the local residents and assist them in their problems, which usually involves fighting some Heartless. In this game, as we defeat Heartless, we are able to obtain the light that the creature has trapped within itself. The bigger or more dangerous the enemy, the more light, or lux, it has trapped, and each wielder will take the light back to their union. There is a competition between each union to see who can collect the most lux, with wielders being rewarded for collecting the most in the form of rewards, which forms a cyclical re relationship. Rewards make characters stronger, which makes them able to take down more dangerous enemies, which allows them to gather more light. I will be skipping the storylines of all the various Disney worlds here, as, unfortunately, the interactions between our wielder and these Disney characters has a little to no bearing on the larger plot. After several months of executing our missions in the various worlds, Chirithi offers us a reward, a bangle to make our cards even stronger. As we channel the borrowed powers of these people in the cards, this bangle will purify the sins of these characters and make our borrowed attacks significantly more powerful. We, and every other Keyblade wielder, take these items and equip them. However, all is not as it seems. The Chirithi that gave us this bangle was not our own. In fact, it was an imposter. It looks pretty normal right now, but for the sake of clarity, let's call it Dark Chirithi. Weeks pass by, and things are relatively normal. Our character even meets a group of Keyblade wielders and forms a friendly rivalry with them, agreeing to join them on a heartless hunt. Our Chirithi and their Chirithi discuss the situation. We don't yet realize the imminent danger that befalls us. In the Foreteller's chamber, Master Ira addresses his fellow Foretellers. He has discovered a Chirithi that appears darker than the usual ones sniffing around the tower. He concludes that this is the Chirithi that was handing out the bangles to the players, and in fact, when wielders use these bangles, they are directly using the powers of darkness. Seeing as the bangles could not have been made by just anyone, Ira correctly guesses what Gula already knows. There is a traitor amongst the Foretellers' midst. And the Foretellers react exactly as they were instructed to. Ased, seeing a moment of weakness from Ira, makes a power play, casting doubt in Ira's leadership among the other Foretellers. Envy tries to maintain the peace by calling Ased off, but insists there's no proof behind Ira's claim. Gula is cautious, always watching for any signs of the traitor to reveal themselves, and when Ased storms out, Gula follows, potentially already suspecting Ased. Ava hopes the situation can be resolved, before also making her leave. With Envy and Ira now alone, they speak less formally. Envy is worried, as making an accusation like this is very out of character for Ira, but there is still worse news to come. Ira has been pondering through the book again, as always, and realized that this revolution about the traitor is nowhere to be found within the Book of Prophecies. He surmises that the foreteller's copy of the book must have a missing page to explain this. Ira is remarkably perceptive here, calling both that there is a traitor and that there is a missing page. Potentially too perceptive? After we hunt down our heartless, we return to our new rivals. However, we find only the Chirithi, and it tells us that their wielder couldn't make it back. It seems that they have fallen in their fight against the darkness. Our Chirithi refines to find the other wielder's Chirithi fading away. It seems that when their bonded wielder perishes, they too cease to exist. Our union leader watches as it fades away into nothingness, and remarks that as quickly as we are gathering light, it seems the darkness is spreading even faster. Our Chirithi asks if that is proof that there really is a traitor, but our union leader is not convinced just yet. One night, we dream of the foreteller's chamber in the clock tower, observing the master of masters address his five pupils, but are quickly surrounded by darkness and awoken before we can see too much. Our Chirithi reassures us and sends us back to bed. Outside the window, however, the dark Chirithi looks in, 
wondering why Archerithi showed us that dream. Ours wants to do the exact opposite of the Dark One, making them enemies. A little while later, we are completing our latest mission to track down some strong Heartless. As we hunt, we run into a fellow wielder needing to rest after taking down a dark side. We help him to his feet and introduce ourselves. His name is Ephema, and no matter which union we belong to, he will belong to a different one. He isn't working on the mission from his union leader today though. He is trying to investigate the secrets of the worlds we visit. He has somehow discovered that the worlds we venture to aren't actually real at all, but instead are holograms conjured up by the Book of Prophecies, and he wants to know why. Ephemer's mentioning of the Foretellers reminds us of the dream we had the other night, and we tell him that we saw the Foretellers in the Sanctum in our dream. The two of us are now keen to investigate, and head off to the Clock Tower. Dark Chirithi appears to taunt our Chirithi, wondering if it will allow us to discover the truth. We search around the base of the tower, but are unable to find a way in on the surface. However, exploring through the underground waterways leads us to a secret passageway into the tower. We are about to head in, but Ephemer stops us. He reasons that it took all this time for us to find the entrance today. If we stay and explore now, someone will surely notice that we are gone. We promise to meet at the fountain tomorrow at noon and begin our search properly. Around the time we were meeting Ephema, the foretellers were having a meeting of their own. Master Aset has invited Gula, Ava and Envy to propose forming an alliance among their unions, to pull together their light and withstand the growing darkness. He doesn't believe that any of the five are traitors, but seeing as Ira is too preoccupied with trying to find one, there will be no convincing him. Gula is on board, but as the Master forbade the forming of alliances, Ava finds herself unable to join. Envy walks in and is immediately suspicious of what is transpiring, throwing around accusations of Ased being a traitor. Ased fires back, accusing Envy of being tainted by darkness due to her spying and reporting back to Ira. Later that day at the fountain, Ava is musing about the events that have transpired when Ephemer walks by, on his way home after exploring with us. He tries to cheer her up, and jokingly tries to get her to share some of her foreteller secrets. Ephemer once asks Ava why the unions are forced to compete over the light instead of working together, and Ava admits that she has recently been asking herself the same thing. Ephemer tells Ava that he met a friend today from another union, us, and that we are meeting again tomorrow. Ava seems very happy about this news, telling Ephemer to go home and get some sleep. If the worst happens, she will be happy to leave the world in the hands of those that would work in harmony with others. Envy reports back to Ira, telling the leader of Ased's plot to form an alliance. Ira concludes that he must be the traitor, but Envy now doubts it. She sees that Ased is only gathering force as a means to oppose the darkness, despite it going against the Master's teachings. However, seeing as Ased is suspicious of the meetings between Envy and Ira, Envy says she will make them less frequent. Ira wants to talk Ased and Gula out of the alliance himself, but Envy tells him she will do it. So Ira continues to sit up in the tower, alone, poring over the Book of Prophecies as always. The Foretellers are in a bad state. Tensions are beginning to rise between them, and this suspicion of a traitor means that no one can truly trust each other. The darkness is growing strength every day, and they are forbidden to join forces to do anything about it. The only option the Foretellers have is to gather light to make them and their union stronger. And they are forcing themselves into a stalemate, because that is what all the other unions are doing and they can't fall behind because if there is a traitor, then that traitor will definitely keep going and gathering lux, and should the traitor be the only one left gathering light and all the other non-traitors stop, then the traitor will control all the light, potentially being able to summon Kingdom Hearts. Anyway, back to our character. We excitedly head to bed in anticipation for tomorrow's meeting with Ephemer. However, that snake in the grass heads out in the dead of night without us, only to be stopped by someone, probably Master Ava. Ava was impressed with Ephemer and she invites him to lead the group of wielders that will escape this world into an alternate reality when the war begins. A reality very much like this one, however everyone that arrives here will be made to forget all about the strife between the foretellers. Ephemer accepts, and is not physically seen again for a long time. The next day we wait at the fountain for Ephemer to arrive, though he never does. We are very upset, and Adshirithi attempts to comfort us. As we lift our little friend into the air, we get the initial reveal that this creature is emblazoned with the symbol of a spirit dream eater from Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. And as a reminder, these are benevolent creatures that protect sleeping people by consuming nightmares. As we sleep that night, Ephemer visits us in our dreams. He takes us back to the tower's secret entrance, but realizes that we aren't ready to follow him just yet, vanishing in a cloud of dandelions. We bolt awake, and take this dream as a sign to look for Ephema. We return to the waterways, only to find Master Ava blocking our way. 
We tell her that we are trying to find Ephema as we think he tried to contact us in a dream. Ava hints that we are not too far off from the truth and decides to test our strength. After one of the first, most challenging fights of the game, at the time, we pass her test. She is impressed by our strength but sees sadness in her heart, hoping that we can find a way to let it go. She sends us home and asks that we respect that the tower is off limits. That night, as we sleep, Master Ava appears in our room. She realizes if Ephema can reach us in our dreams, then he must have found a way to communicate from the UNCHAINED realm he is in. Apparently we are getting close to that realm as well. We spend the next few months performing missions in the worlds we are familiar with. It is worth pointing out that all of the worlds we visit, except for Olympus Colosseum, is the homeworld of a princess of heart. We form a rivalry with another wielder who is kind of a jerk, but then turns out to be not so bad, but during this time nothing of much interest happens to the player. A few months after forging the alliance, Envy has convinced Gula to call it quits. Not only has nothing suspicious happened recently, but there has been no headway into finding the identity of the traitor, nor has Ased gained the support of the other three. Ased vows that Envy will pay for this. Envy, you will regret this! As a reward for all our hard work lately, our Chirithi gives us a bangle of light. This trinket offers us protection in the corridors of darkness, and we traverse these to take down a strong and exhausting dark side. When we return to Daybreak Town out of breath, our Chirithi acknowledges that this is tough work, but if we don't gather light, then the other unions will get ahead. A new character emerges from a similar portal and asks why that matters, as the goal to protect the light should be one that all unions share, not a competition. Her name is Skald, and she is the leader of a party that Ephemer once belonged to before he disappeared. Ephema reached out to her in a dream and told her to find us and warn us. The world is about to end. The two young wielders decide to head back to the tower, the last place they saw Ephema, but as they are about to head off, they hear a large, booming sound. Master is said as challenged Envy, and the two trade ferocious blows across Daybreak Town. Gula watches intensely, and when he sees Master Ava arrive, he feigns that he too has only just arrived. Envy publicly accuses Ased of being the traitor, and Envy, Gula, and Ava raise their blades in unison against their comrade. But Ased is not done just yet. In this time, Skald and our character have been rushing to the tower. As we sprint across town, we are ambushed by three grotesque creatures that cry out for Lux. We fend them off and give chase, but are interrupted by the Dark Cherithi. Now completely purple and with glowing red eyes, Dark Chirithi taunts us and teases that if it took everyone's lux away, then there wouldn't be any need to fight over it anymore. Those Darklings that we just fought used to be wielders, but they took absolutely any actions necessary to gain lux, and in their pursuit of power became corrupted by darkness. Our Chirithi demands to know which wielder the Dark Chirithi is bonded to. Dark Chirithi only says that they are closer than we think and vanishes. Frazzled, we continue racing to the waterway. In the meantime, Daybreak Town has been completely rocked by the battle between the Foretellers. Gula looks completely fine though. He probably strategically avoided the fight as to observe the others. Gula finds Ased, who was clearly exhausted and wounded from battle, and had taken refuge inside the house where he had held the earlier meeting. Gula arrogantly approaches the weakened Ased, and reveals that there is a lost page to the Book of Prophecies that he is in possession of, which instructs him to find and eliminate the traitor. Ased's anger fuels into his feet, and Gula is quickly overwhelmed and knocked out. Ava rushes in and uses her body to shield the fallen wielder, prompting Ased to show mercy and limp away. Ava decides to take Gula into hiding for his own protection. Injured and exhausted, Ased slumps through the streets of Daybreak Town, nearly collapsing as Ira finds him. Believing that Ira has come to finish him off, Ased only asks that he make it quick. But Ira has not come to fight. The world cannot afford to lose one of the five lights. Ira does not believe Ased is the traitor, but Ased is starting to think that Gula might be. He tells Ira about Gula's lost page, validating Ira's suspicion that such a page exists. Ira is determined to see that lost page. During this time, our player and Skald have fought their way through the passageways and arrived at the entrance to the tower. Stepping through, they finally find the foreteller's chamber, though it is completely empty. Chirithi urges them to leave, but it's too late. Someone has found them. It is the leader of the player's union, in my case, Master Gula. The leaders claim that they caught Ephema sneaking around here, and that even though Ephema pretended to be our friend, he was only doing so to steal our lux. So our leader killed him. Our Chirithi tries to take the blame for our intrusion, and tries to get us out of there, but we step forward, and after being silent nearly the whole game so far, we speak. 
We have served the Foretellers unquestioningly up to this point, defeating countless Heartless and working so hard for our union. But for the first time when we met Ephemer, we found that we had made a true friend. But our leader took him away from us. We are hurt, we are sad, we are angry. We don't even care if that means we have fallen to darkness, but we will not just accept his death. Our leader took our friend from us, and now they will face our wrath. We are going to fight our own leader. We throw everything we have into this battle and seem to really do some damage. However, none of this was as it seemed. We were not fighting our leader. We were not even in the foreteller's chamber. This was all a test set up by Master Arva to test curious wielders to see if they have what it takes to join the dandelions and we passed. Ephemer is actually fine, waiting in the alternate reality to our own, and when the war dawns, we have the opportunity to join him. Skald accepts, but we request some time to think about it. After all, we would not feel right simply abandoning all the others who will not be chosen. But we do not have long to think about it. Ephemer sent his warning that the war is nearly here, and seeing as the foretellers are clashing publicly now, he is probably right. Master Arva has been hiding the injured Gula from Ased and Ira. Envy doesn't trust Arva, and betrays her by telling Ira where Gula is hiding. Ira is on his way to Gula right now, but Arva steps up and blocks his path, and the guy just backs down. Arva returns to Gula, and Gula spills the beans about the Lost Page. The Lost Page apparently says that there will be an inevitable betrayal by the one who bears the sigil. But which sigil? The Recusant Sigil? The sigil that became incorporated into the names of Organization 13? Another of the many sigils that have appeared in this series? Gula does not know who the traitor is, but suspected a said, which is why Gula finally decided to confront him. However, he has failed, and is no closer to finding out who the traitor is. Out of desperation, Gula plans to force the Master of Masters to return to set everything right, and the only way he can do this is by summoning Kingdom Hearts. If his union gathers enough light, he can pull this impossible feat off, and then the Master will have to return. He wants Arva to help, but summoning Kingdom Hearts was strictly forbidden by the Master, and Arva refuses to go against his teachings. Gula understands, and limps away. Arva tells Envy about Gula's scheme. Envy now realises why Ira and Ased have been so frantic about gathering Lux themselves. The only way they can be sure the traitor doesn't summon Kingdom Hearts is to gather enough Lux themselves and maintain the balance of light between the unions. Envy and Arva now realise that they also have no choice but to gather Lux at the same frantic pace, even if this only delays the inevitable. The once friendly competition for Lux is now completely devolved into a bitter and jealous struggle between the wielders, with some wielders allegedly stealing Lux from other unions. The Keyblade War draws closer by the day. Arva begins training the Dandelions, saying that they will be headed to a world that looks just like their own, only it is made of dreams. They will need to use this skill of entering the dream world when the war does arrive, so that even though the world is lost, they will survive. May your hearts be your guiding key. Our character walks through Daybreak Town one day to see two wielders at each other's throats, accusations of theft and treachery, before eventually a fight breaks out, which we rush to break up. Skald pleads with the combatants. Keyblades are meant for the Heartless, not for each other. But the fighters callously remark that any thief of Lux deserves to have a Keyblade used against them. Master Ased agrees. He feels that in the Great War, the union with the strongest wielders will prevail, not the one that gathers the most light. And Master Arva obviously feels the same way, after all, she is cherry-picking wielders from every union, weakening the others while strengthening her own. He has misinterpreted Arvo carrying out her role as her preparing for war, and he intends to do the same. A said belittle Skull for her affiliation with the Dandelions, but we step up in response, as we do not yet belong to them. Master Ased wants to make an example of us, and asks us to raise our blade. After making a mockery of us and claiming we fail as a Keyblade wielder, Ira appears and calls him off bewildered that Ased would raise his blade against a pupil. Ased claims to have only tested our strength, as he wants to recruit strong wielders as well. While the other four become so preoccupied with gathering Lux, he will raise the strongest army, and through strength, banish the other four leaders, and unite all wielders under his own union. Ira warns Ased not to overestimate himself. Ased may be strong, but he's not that strong. As Ased and the other onlookers depart, Skald asks Ira, why is he agreeing to the final battle? After all, if they know there will be no winner, then why march towards their death? Ira simply answers, If all five do not fight, then someone will win. And that victor will summon Kingdom Hearts, which will have untold consequences upon the world. The faded battle is now mere days away. We pass out from exhaustion, and Skald and Chirithi take us home. We dream of the faded land, a great battlefield littered with the Keyblades of fallen wielders, and we are watched by many people covered in shadows. Skald and Chirithi discuss as we sleep, 
There have been many fights like the one we saw happening today all over Daybreak Town. The Masters have completely fallen apart. Their personalities have totally changed. Skald has been trying to convince more wielders to join the Dandelions and save themselves from the final battle. Unfortunately, in the last couple of days, Master Arva has disappeared, and without their recruiter's presence, some Dandelions are actually going back to fight for their unions in the war. Chirithi thinks Master Gula might know where Arva is. After all, the two of them are good friends. We decide that tomorrow we will search for Master Gula. Hopefully he can at least tell us where Arva is. I think now would be the best time to introduce you to the character Streletzia. This fellow wielder started her journey around the same time we did, two years before the war. She, like all the other thousands of wielders, followed the orders of their leaders, carrying out her missions and collecting lux in various worlds. She never really had any friends to talk to, but one day she learned of us. She observed us by the fountain on the day we were supposed to see Ephema. At the end of the day, she returned to find us still there, hugging our Chirithi with tears in her eyes, and from that day onward, she seemed to notice us everywhere. She always wanted to work up the courage to talk to us, but could never quite muster it. Streletzia also became a dandelion, and one day, she received a visit from Master Ava. Ava had selected her to lead one of the five new unions in the new world. In her bed that night, Streletzia can hardly believe that this is real. She reads through a special green notebook, learning of her new role and responsibilities in the new world, but she is very worried for all those who will be left behind. Suddenly she realizes, we are not a dandelion. We will be left and forced to fight. She wants to run out and find us now to convince us to join the dandelions, but as it is too late at night, she resolves to wait until the morning and wait for us at the fountain, where we can often be found. The next morning, our character and Skald are able to find Gula within an empty house in the district of Daybreak Town. Perhaps he is still wounded from his battle with the Sed and in hiding from Ira. Gula asks if we are part of Arva's dandelions, searching for our missing master. If we find her, will we implore her to do something about the inevitable crisis? Unfortunately, not even Arva can stop what is fated to happen now, but there is someone who could. Gula still hopes that if the Master of Masters were to return, perhaps he could set things right. But even though Gula and Arva have searched relentlessly, they have found no trace of him. But there might be someone who does know where he went. The sixth apprentice, Lushu. That is where Arva has been, searching for Lushu. And it is at this moment that she finally found him, dutifully performing his role on a hilltop overlooking Daybreak Town. And as always, watching. Lushu tells Arva that he was not given a book of prophecies. Instead, his mission is to survive to the time that the book describes. He will witness the Keyblade War, and then set off toward the unknown future with Keyblade in hand. He speaks vaguely about the Lost Page, about the future that has already been foretold, but that the foretellers do not know about, and about the Master of Masters true intentions. Arva asks if all of this, the breakdown of the Five, the fights over Lux, the Great War, and even the end of the world, were all what the Master wanted to happen. Lushu says that the Master does not care about the fate of the world, only what comes after. Lushu seems to have knowledge of the Lost Page, and everything he does is in accordance with it, which is strange because as far as we know, Gula is the only one with a copy, and he can't seem to make any sense of it. Ava flat out asks, Lushu, have you been behind all of this? Are you the traitor? Lushu does not respond with words, but does summon his keyboard. Back in the abandoned house, Gula reads from the Lost Page. And though I am extremely grateful to have these unofficial translations provided by Kingdom Hearts Insider or Everglow, I would love nothing more than to see these scenes in their official translated form. Master Gula reads, Unable to permit disharmony, you will be disappointed by fate and lose sight of true strength. Misreading the truth, you will venture forth in secrecy. Back to the hill. Gula has also told Arva something from the Lost Page. Whether he told her the same text that Gula just told us, who can say? I get the feeling that he told us something else though, as Arva seemingly cannot believe her ears, unable to accept that this is not only the truth, but also how the master planned it. Lushu claims that this is the truth about the traitor. Whatever Lushu told her seems to have cemented within Arva's mind that this battle is 100% unavoidable. In her disbelief, Arva assumes that Lushu must simply be twisting the master's wishes for his own goals, drawing her keyblade. Skald is having a hard time processing the passage as well when Gula reveals to her that there is more. And then, with one final strike, a bell will toll for the final battle, and the battle shall begin at last, and the time shall be chosen. Chirithi thinks that there is no way Gula should be telling them something this important, and Gula agrees. However, as the battle is now so close and utterly unavoidable, he hardly thinks it matters. At that moment, Arva lashes out at Lushu, their keyblades colliding and sending a ripple throughout all of Daybreak Town, ringing the large bell atop the clock tower and letting everybody know. The war has truly begun. The wielders will now assemble amongst their unions, ready to head to that fated place. Outside of the house, Skald and the player talk. 
We have still not made up our mind to join the Dandelions, but Skull does not want us to fight. She will return to the Dandelions, hoping that we make the right choice. We talk to our Chirithi. If we die, so will our little friend, but it isn't worried about itself. It is truly worried about us, and it does not want us to fight. It seems like we are about to finally make the decision to join the Dandelions when we are interrupted by a voice, taunting us for running away from the battle and abandoning those who will stay behind. It is none other than the Purple Nightmare, Dark Chirithi. It confirms to the player that it was the one who handed out the bangles on behalf of the Master of Masters, making all the wielders capture and use the power of darkness without even realizing it. And to top it all off, Dark Chirithi claims to be ours. We are its wielder and the darkness it's feeding off is ours. It has not been following us around like our spirit Chirithi. It has been off following its own plans, stealing Lux and corrupting other wielders into the grotesque darklings that we saw before. Speaking of which, three darklings attack us and Chirithi finishes by saying that if we won't join the final battle, then it will show us a dream. Our Chirithi wants to know what the point of attacking its own player is, but Dark Chirithi says that as a nightmare, it has the power to show bad dreams. It can sever the bonds between player and dream eater, and live free. We defeat the Darklings, but Dark Chirithi hops down and absorbs them into itself, forming a large boss monster emblazoned with a nightmare symbol. Defeating this large abomination of a creature as well, Dark Chirithi seems almost happy and says that now that we have severed the bond, it can roam and be free. It looks forward to seeing us in another dream. Streletsia's Chirithi runs up to her and says that it has spotted us, presumably when we were outside of the house, talking with Skald, as she takes off at full speed. She enters the building that we just came out of and walks inside the dark room. It appears to be empty though, and she turns around to leave. Suddenly, from the shadows, a figure appears and strikes, fatally wounding the young wielder and taking her rule book. In her last moments, Streletsia wishes that she'd have had the courage to talk to us and doesn't quite make it outside before her heart floats up into the sky and her body vanishes. The war has begun. The five unions and their leaders assemble, charging forward into battle. In a surprisingly moving scene, Keyblade wielders take up arms against one another and the hearts of the victims begin to float up into the sky. Resolving to not give up just yet, we are approached by one of the union leaders. Our character will battle four Union leaders, all except their own, but I will show the footage from all five battles. First is a Ased. Challenging us and praising us for not backing down, he finds us worthy this time, seeing us as a major threat and striking us while our guard is down. The only thing saving us is the arrival of Era, who locks blades with a Ased before the two of them fly off into the battlefield. Next is Master Envy, who apologizes that we had to be a part of this war before again attacking. Perhaps her heart is simply not in this fight, or perhaps we really are that strong, but we are able to hold her off. That would absolutely exhaust us. Envy withdraws her Keyblade, wishing us a long and happy life before walking away. Hearts fly right past us as we reach out in sorrow, but there is no time to mourn. Master Gula approaches. Despite our severely weakened state, and despite the fact that he just shared the secrets of the book with us, he attacks us as well. Again, we hold off the foreteller, who says that should he actually have to put in effort to defeat us, he would rather not. He takes off into the sky, saying, perhaps we will meet again. We collapse on the ground, and Keyblades rain from the sky. Master Era approaches. After another grueling battle, Era pauses to recognize our potential, noting how much of a waste it will be to lose a wielder like this in this pointless war. Lining up to finish us off, he is instead interrupted by a Sed, who looks to finish the battle once and for all. Claiming that he will rebuild this world as its new king, a Sed and Era take off into the air to continue their clash. And should the player not be in the Vulpers Union, they will come across Ava as the final battle. We tell her that we looked everywhere for her, and hope that she can still end the fighting, but to our dismay, Master Ava raises her blade against us, telling us to raise ours. Whatever Lushu said to her, it clearly robbed Ava of the hopeful nature that she once held, and after the battle she walks away from us, hoping that we will get far, far away and join the Dandelions before it is too late. After the four battles, we collapse, dying. Achirithi hugs us, and it seems that at last the fighting has ceased. We may be the last surviving murderer of the war among a graveyard of lifeless keys. All hope for us seems lost, but a beam of light rains down, and who should step through but Skull and Ephema? With tears welling up, we reach out to him, the boy who had broken his promise, but it made it back to us in the end. He reaches out his hand, and we slowly reach up and take it. Master Lushu, as always,
watches from afar. The sky is a swirling black tundra, but from within that darkness the clouds part and the light of the one true Kingdom Hearts shines down onto the battlefield. The light held by all of the Keyblade wielders rises up into the air, absorbed by Kingdom Hearts, and right behind the light are the hearts of all the wielders. Lushu can see all of this, and of course, so can the Master of Masters through the eye embedded in his Keyblade. Despite this being the end of Kingdom Hearts Key, the mobile game Unchained Key continues the story. There is a credit sequence to Kingdom Hearts Key, and an epilogue, but we are not ready to learn about that just yet. After taking our dying character and placing us within the alternate reality where the dandelions reside at the end of the war, Ephema does as he was instructed and returns to the location of the battle, in the real world. This is where the five new Union leaders are to meet and begin their reign over the dandelions. The first to arrive is Ephema, but he is soon joined by Skald. Ephema is surprised to see that she is the second leader, but Skald isn't too surprised to see him. Soon after, number three arrives. It is none other than the playable character of Birth by Sleep, Ventus. He claims to have always been on his own, never ranked too highly, and doesn't have that many friends. While the three converse, the fourth walks up, a male with an obscure face and hair that reminds me of Zexion's. He claims that his name is Brain. Okay. He assumed that he would be the last to arrive, and quickly asks if Ephema is the new leader. The four have really only just arrived, so nothing like that has been decided yet. So next Brain asks if the rules in the green rulebook are ironclad, or if there is some wiggle room. Skald says the rules are rules, and Brain finds that she reminds him of Master Ava, the second person to say this. Brain wonders if the new five can even trust Master Ava. After all, she expects them to just lie to everyone, pondering if it wouldn't just be easier for everyone to know the truth. Ephema remembers what Ava had once said to him when he posed a similar question. Would telling everyone the horrors that he had personally witnessed actually make things any better? Or would it make more sense to keep them in the dark for now? Now to wait for the final member of the new group. It seems like quite some time has passed, but finally number 5 arrives. It is a man with pink hair, addressing himself as Lorium. Fans of the series will instantly recognize this character as the complete somebody that lost his heart and became the nobody Malusha, the primary antagonist of Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. I'm sure you must have a million questions at this point, but we are so close to the end, let's keep going. So where is our character right now? Well, as we said earlier, they have joined the Dandelions in an alternate version of the world they once knew. We, and all the other Dandelions that entered this alternate reality, had our memories erased as we arrived. We got here, dove to our heart again, obtained our Keyblade again, met our Chirithi, Ephemer and Skald again, we are reliving our entire journey so far, but the only difference is, this time, there will be no war. Some of you have undoubtedly realized by now, but if not, Kingdom Hearts Key is the original journey. Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key was not simply a remake. From a story perspective, our character has already gone through all the events leading up to the war and lived through it, and is now re-experiencing their journey in a dream world. Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key receives essentially the same story up until the point at which the Dandelions have been trained for their journey into the new world, and after that point, the stories diverge. So what is life like without the ongoing threat of a war? Well, we essentially keep on carrying out our ignorant, obedient life, collecting lux and completing missions. On one of our missions to defeat a large Heartless that tore up the Moogle shop, we meet four new allies, and from that point onwards have many fun adventures with them. Hunting Heartless together through various worlds, and even taking a summer and Halloween vacation with them. During our missions we gain access to two new worlds, the Castle of Dreams and the Enchanted Dominion, homeworld of Cinderella and Aurora respectively. The only missing princess at this point is Kairi. At the one year anniversary of Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key's official launch, the game was renamed and relaunched as Kingdom Hearts Union Cross where Cross is a stand-in for the Key or Kai, sigil that adorns all three of these games. One of the key features that accompanies this update was the ability to do missions with friends, a true cooperative but non-canon multiplayer mode. And I believe the missions with our new friends are the story equivalent of that. Though we can now do multiplayer missions with our friends in real life, and it is called Union Cross, the player is experiencing the same thing, completing their missions with four of their friends, their own version of Union Cross. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. However, life is not perfect for our character. For one, we keep experiencing terrible nightmares of our past life. We remember the Keyblade War, our near death, we remember clashing with Master Ased in the streets, and we remember the end of the world. Our Chirithi watches us sleep, and one night after experiencing another bout of nightmares, we ask how long we slept for. Chirithi responds, 
no longer than usual. I love this line, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but to me it says that every single time we fall asleep, we re-experience a dream version of our entire journey so far. Our Chirithi is secretly reporting our nightmares back to Skald and Ephema. Skald is concerned about them, and Ephema asks that Chirithi not forget its main task, to get us to participate in Union Cross. On a meta level, the multiplayer mode Union Cross is one of the only activities in the game that rewards you with the in-game currency used to power your character up. But from a story perspective, the reasoning behind this is, as Skald says, that having new adventures with friends is a great way to bury sad memories deep within one's heart. She is clearly referring to the memories of the tragedy that we witnessed. In the Kingdom Hearts series, a person's heart is almost like a physical, tangible object that once imprinted on with an experience, whether negative or positive, that experience will always linger in the heart, even if we forget about it. Even though our memory has been wiped, that horrible imprint of witnessing all of our friends perish in the war is still a part of our heart, and indeed memories of the conflict are on all of the Dandelion's hearts. So by replacing those memories with new, happy ones, that sadness will be pushed down. Not erased, mind you, just buried, which seems like a bit of a band-aid on a much larger wound. Ephemus says that we cannot stand to lose anyone right now, that the darkness in this world is different, that it seems to have a mind of its own. Ephemus worries whenever something happens in this reality that didn't happen in the previous one. Ephemus also seems to have his doubts about the whole Union Cross business, but Skald reassures him, it was in the rules, so it must be the right thing to do, right? In case anyone needs a reminder, the Master of Masters is the one who selected the five Union leaders and gave Ava the rulebook to give to them. Perhaps Ephema is right to be suspicious. In any case, now that the five Foretellers have assembled, they can make their way to the Foretellers Tower, which technically belongs to them now, deciding for the moment not to split the Dandelions into five Unions again to avoid repeating history. The group also thinks that they shouldn't tell anyone that the Foretellers are presumably dead to avoid any panic or confusion. It is worth noting that all of the members, except honestly Ven, seem familiar with the contents of their rulebook, like they have had enough time to read it. Just a reminder, but one of these people should not be here. Streletzia was given a rulebook by Ava, and was supposed to become a union leader, however an assassin stole the book and killed her, and now one of these five is in her place. During this entire conversation, Brain finds what appears to be a copy of the Book of Prophecies sitting on the Master's desk, and he has been reading it. He takes a page from it, finding what appears to be the new group's first task. They are to create little spirits for each of the wielders, little dream eater pets that will help devour nightmares. Skald remembers that our character is suffering nightmares of our previous life, and is more than happy to do this if it will help the Dandelions forget about the past. Skald, Ephema, and Ventus set off to go collect materials for the new pets. But Lorium does not want to go, claiming he does not enjoy that sort of work, but he is more than happy to stay in the tower helping Brain with the chemistry behind it. Curious. Perhaps Lorium cannot wield a Keyblade, and would therefore be outed as a fraud should the need to enter combat arise. And unfortunately, that is- Now is probably a good time to talk about the secret ending of Kingdom Hearts Key. It can be inferred that at one point during our adventures through the Enchanted Dominion, we dozed off and took one of our many sleeps. Dreaming yet again of our entire adventures so far, we wake up, somewhat confused as to how we got there. Chirithi says that ever since the day that Arva asked us to join the Dandelions and we saw Skald off, that we've been having these strange dreams. Again, to reiterate, the implication here is that we are in the dream reality, constantly reliving our experience in the dream world every time we fall asleep. So we stand on a cliff, overlooking the castle at Enchanted Dominion, a world that wasn't playable in the original Kingdom Hearts Key. Overhead, a bird flies across the gap which we cannot pass, and we resolve to go home and figure out a way across tomorrow. The bird continues flying, and lands on the shoulder of its master, Maleficent. Now, versions of Disney villains exist within Kingdom Hearts Union Cross. Hologram versions of Jafar, the Queen of Hearts, and even Maleficent herself are fightable. However, this Maleficent is not a hologram. She in fact seems very real. She states, It seems it went well presumably talking about the process of entering the dream world. Even so, where is that fool gone now? Presumably talking about Pete. Oh well, not even Sora and his friends can meddle in this world. Nuisances can't get in. This is very clearly the Maleficent we have fought before in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. And based on the secret ending of Kingdom Hearts RA Coded, it seems that she has succeeded in her goal in finding a way into the dream world. The big question is then, how did she get here? And more importantly, did she actually travel back in time to do it? 
And after months of what can very generously be described as filler story content, while series director Tetsuya Nomura had his main attention focused on finishing Kingdom Hearts 3, in October 2018, the Japanese version finally received an update to the main story. It seems that Maleficent has realized that because her heart was forcibly removed from her body by the possessed Riku in Kingdom Hearts 1, she can indeed cast her body behind and travel back in time as Master Xehanort taught her to. She intended to return to a past version of her world and and re-attempt to capture the seven princesses of heart. However, things did not go to plan. She thought she had returned to the true Enchanted Dominion. Aurora was still cursed by Maleficent and tricked into falling asleep. A curse was still put on the entire kingdom to make them sleep as well, and Prince Philip was still captured. However, instead of Terra, Ven, and Aqua having a hand in the story, this time our character does, yet the tale still ends the same way. Prince Philip's enchanted sword still finds its way into Maleficent's draconic heart, and she is defeated. Injured, she limps back to the castle, lamenting that even though she returned to the past, she still couldn't change her fate. A mysterious being that simply refers to itself as the darkness stands sheltered in shadow and reveals to her that they couldn't allow that to happen. Okay, this is going to get pretty confusing. Here goes. In the real world, the Master of Masters used his Book of Prophecies to create the five illusionary worlds that we explore in Kingdom Hearts Key. But after the Keyblade War was waged, the Master and all the Foretellers disappeared. When the new Union leaders took all the dandelions and sent them to the dream world, there were no foretellers or master to maintain those illusionary worlds. In anticipation of this, data copies of these worlds were made, controlled simulations where the events played out exactly as they had the first time around and could continue beyond where we got to in Kingdom Hearts Key. Versions of the Castle of Dreams and the Enchanted Dominion were made as well, even though the worlds weren't finished and visitable in Kingdom Hearts Key. So when Maleficent tried to travel back in time to the Enchanted Dominion that she came from, she mistakenly ended up in the Data One, trapped here by the darkness. They cannot allow her to return to the true past because of what she knows about the future. Perhaps if she were to change things, this would alter them from the course that the Master of Masters needs them to be in in order to enact his plan. Because of Maleficent's knowledge, Radiant Garden was intentionally left out of the recreation, the homeworld of Kairi. Perhaps the data recreations of the world's inhabitants are so accurate that should Maleficent have access to all seven princesses, even in the data world, she could really cause some havoc. Despite it seeming that Maleficent is trapped in the past, Darkness says that there is a way for her to return. So just who is this Darkness? People are already suspecting that it is Lushu, or the Master of Masters, an incarnation of Xehanort perhaps, or even Malusha. The way the being refers to itself is intentionally vague but it seems to imply that it is working with the Master of Masters, or at the very least is acting in accordance with the Master's insanely comprehensive knowledge of events. It truly seems like everything that has ever happened in the series is going exactly as he planned. However, there does seem to be some evidence that this darkness is the same being that struck down Streletzia. Ephema did state that the darkness in this world seems to have a mind of its own. Perhaps we didn't realize just how literal he was being. Personally, I feel like Dark Chirithi's involvement in this tale is not yet complete either. But speculation aside for now, that finally wraps up everything we know for sure about the story of Kingdom Hearts Key and its successes so far. The Japanese and global versions of the game receive story updates every month, so in mid-November, December, and January, I expect to receive three more important updates before Kingdom Hearts 3 is finally released. And I shall be making supplementary videos to this one as soon as they are out. If you made it this far, I want to thank you so much for watching. Before the release of Kingdom Hearts 3, I still want to give my opinions of where I think the story will head that we didn't have time to cover in this video. So if you enjoyed this video, I would very much like for you to subscribe and stay tuned for more. And please share the video around. Please tell me your take on everything that has happened so far and where you think this story will go. There is a very interesting, if convoluted, story hidden under multiple layers, games, and about 850 quests here. And I feel it will be very important to know for Kingdom Hearts 3. Thanks again, and I'll see you really soon.